Now, our uh, speaker for this, this last session is uh, very special. He started yesterday with the lecture. I hope um, many of you were able to catch that one yesterday. But uh, today, the title of this last one is Whole Body Synergy for Optimal Health and Lung Health. So I'm sure that we're going to learn a lot with that. It has to do with the immune system. And our speaker is Dr. Laren Tan. Now, Dr. Laren, he has quite a list of qualifications, um, but he is the, uh, the department chair of medicine at Loma Linda University. I was blessed listening to him yesterday, and I'm sure that's going to be a blessing right now. He is going to do the prayer, so don't think I forgot to pray, but he wants to pray for his, for his talk. But we will all be praying for the Lord to uh, use and guide him in helping us understand more about the synergy that all of us can have. Dr. Laren, may God bless you right now. Thank you, Pastor Lucas. Welcome. What a pleasure it is to be here. Um, yesterday was, an, was a great day. Um, today looks to be much better. And before we begin, shall we bow our heads and let's pray. Gracious God, we just thank you. Thank you for really just this moment, a moment where we can all come together as your people to better understand not only just your word, but also how we can live better for you. Father, we know there's so many things that you want for us to do before you come. And so we just ask that you'll help us to think with clear thoughts. I ask that the words that come out of my mouth will be especially yours, and that, dear Lord, we will, at least I will stand behind the cross, and that whatever is stated, that you will somehow touch someone out there to live a better life. We love you and we thank you in everything we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, Pastor Lucas, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I am humbled to be here again, as stated, uh, for day number two of Amazing Health, our Amazing Facts Health Summit. Uh, to be able to follow Dr. Binus is, is, is fantastic. It was fantastic to also hear Dr. Neil Nedley, um, also Daniel and Jessica Vieira, and also, of course, Pastor Doug earlier today. Um, as stated, this is my second part. Um, it is really part of six key lifestyle practices. And I know earlier I stated about immunity, uh, and I'm sorry, I think that's actually a typo there. But what I will be talking about and focusing a little bit more is physical activity and exercise. And of course, you know that that does affect your immunity, right? And so let me move forward here and advance my slide. Uh, See if we can display. There we go. As stated, my name is Laren Tan. I am the department chair of medicine at Loma University. I serve many, many amazing physicians there. Um, and this is just a great topic, right? I, especially when it comes to exercise and physical activity. But what I did my best was try to also put in not only just what I felt was important, but what nine other physicians who are really physician leaders in their field within the within the field of medicine to also give their input to. So you'll see throughout my presentation really key tips that they want you to know. And this will span from cardiology to endocrinology to gastroenterology. And I hope that you'll take a little bit of something from them too, and not just necessarily also, only just from me. So earlier I stated, well, you know, this is a second part series. And a lot of times, people have always asked, well, what can I do to actually live a healthier life? Well, by following these six lifestyle practices, you can reduce your risk of diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and even some cancers by 70 to 90%. And what are these six key lifestyle practices? That's healthful eating, physical activity, manage stress, relationships, sleep, and avoid risky substances. As a show of hands with Amazing Facts Health Summit, how many of these things do you think we've already touched, right? And that's what's amazing, is that there's so many things that this health summit has already touched, and I'm going to be focusing today more on physical activity. So the prevention of health-related diseases, at least the way I see it, really consists of three things, right? Healthy living, healthy choices, and healthy lifestyle. And throughout these past two days, we've been repeating a lot of various different key aspects. And I think it's fantastic that once again, we're going to be able to reemphasize what's really important and how we can all live a better life. But it does take a team, right? There's been multiple speakers. And that 
I like to say that without counsel, plans go away, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Proverbs 15, verse 22. And I think that many times we look at this as, as only just biblical principles, but I think they're also health principles, and it can be applied to this too. So in addition to just all of our speakers, there is a team of physicians that have helped put this presentation together, and I wanted to be able to acknowledge them, and they come from Loma Linda too. More specifically, our preventive medicine department at Loma Linda. Um, Dr. April Wilson in the back left is actually the department chair of preventive medicine, and I just want to thank her and her team, Rosa Caceres, Sylvia Kramer, Glendy Chin, and also Christina Reyes de La Paz for helping me be able to, to put something together much like this, so this way everybody can better understand the importance of exercise and, what, and how it affects our lives. So as earlier I stated, one way to achieve optimal health is to be physically active. And, I'll, and I'm going to highlight a little bit more on what is the difference between being physically active and, and exercise, right? It sounds very similar. But being physically active can improve your brain health, help manage weight, of course, reduce the risk of various different diseases, strengthen bones, muscles, and improve your ability to do everyday activities. Now, this is just kind of just that starting point, right? And remember earlier I stated, I'm gonna try to interject and put in pretty much little tips that, that other physicians that I've asked um, what their thoughts on, on and how and what the audience would actually perhaps would like, they would like the audience to know. And this is the first one, and this is from a primary care physician. Dr. Pamela Lobo, division head of our general medicine primary care at Loma University. And these are the three tips that she wanted to provide to you in addition to actually exercise. Limit consumption of highly processed foods, especially food in high trans fat. Now I put there especially donuts because that's a reminder to me. If you were here yesterday, you know that that's actually my, my weakness. But limiting consumption of highly processed food, especially trans fats, which not only, right, trans fats actually elevate the bad cholesterol, it decreases the good cholesterol, but it also increases cardiovascular risk. And they also tend to be carbohydrate high, which causes weight gain and increased diabetes. Second point for Dr. Lobo is man minimize your stress, right? You've been hearing this time and time again, and practice healthy sleep habits. Stress is one of the things that we're learning more and more on how it can negatively affect our health and especially our immunity. It can have lasting negative effects, especially on the heart. And when it comes to sleep, according to the National Sleep Foundation, most adults need around seven to nine hours of sleep. Older adults, or we could say those above age of 65, need between seven and eight hours. Babies may need up to 17 hours. And those such as teenagers will range between eight to 10 hours. So if you're falling out or a little bit less, that may not be the best thing. Those are actually pretty good parts. And last but not least, of course, have regular checkups, right? We only know what we know, and it'd be nice to make sure that you follow up with your physician time and time again to make sure you're not missing anything. So in the aspect of exercise, in addition to these three tips, why is exercise important? Earlier today, Pastor Doug talked about how exercise is like the gully washer, and I love that, right? It's amazing. Exercise increases a lot of blood flow, right? It helps to be able to get our blood, the lifeline moving to our, throughout our body. And if you look, I know it's a little small, you can see how actually exercise affects the brain, it increases neural activity. It helps to move a lot of, we could say, blood to various different organs, such as the liver and the pancreas, to the bone, it helps to increase and dilate very various different blood vessels, increase oxygen to all these other different organs. Cardiac output, it's so important, right? To make sure we got appropriate blood flow to the heart. And then last but not least, ventilation helps gas exchange to the lungs. Now I ended with the lungs because as you saw, I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician and the lungs to me are especially important. I have a general bias towards it. And I'd like to say there's a biblical bias to that too. And of course, it began in Genesis 2-7, right? And the Lord formed man in the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, I'm quick to be able to put this up here. And why is that? Because I do believe that it began with the, with the breath going through the lungs and have synergy throughout the body. But the point in this is that especially with lung health, and I will go a little bit more, is that it began with something pure. 
It began with something that was not tainted. And it, and it pains me to see when we actually inhale things such as tobacco smoke or vape, it, to just know that from the very beginning, this was never what God had intended. So as we talk a little bit about the lungs, it's good to be able to know also the respiratory system, right? It begins with the nose, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, and then it goes into the lungs. And then from there, that is where oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange occurs. And I always like to begin with this in this sense because from here, things can then start to become systemic, right? This is where oxygen is given into the body, but without the heart to pump the oxygen to the rest of the various different organs, it's pointless. And so everything is connected to each other. And it's so important that we recognize that. And it's also very important that we recognize that fresh air is critical for lung health. Exercise and eating healthy are also important. And how is that? When we exercise, we're strengthening the intercostal muscles, the muscles in between the ribs, the diaphragm. It helps us to be able to take in deeper breaths. You can imagine if we gain weight and we don't exercise enough, how the belly pushes up against the lung. It can make it harder to actually breathe when we're exerting ourselves. And then, of course, avoid smoking, right? You talked about that. Tobacco or vaping, participate in preventive health measures. And, I, and whenever I think about smoking and just really just eating principles, I can't help but think of this adage. And I know it's more in computer science and mathematics. And perhaps you can complete this for me. Garbage in, it's the same principle with a lot of things, whether that be breathing and just, just health in general. So on this same vein, I'd like to be able to also share with you three tips to avoid life-threatening infections. And you can imagine, at least during COVID, this is very key. So this is Dr. Bryant Nguyen, Division Head of Pulmonary and Critical Care at Loma Linda. And he is actually internationally known for sepsis, a serious condition from infection. And COVID was a big cause of sepsis. And these are his, his tips, at least to avoid life-threatening infections. Lifestyle habits can decrease the likelihood of an infection. Practice good hygiene to avoid developing new infections. And of course, take good care of your chronic health problems and illnesses as they arise and stay up to date on vaccines. Aren't these previous tips fantastic? It does sound very similar to a lot of things that we've actually already been talking about. And that's the key, right? We've been talking about it and more throughout my discussion, I'm gonna actually gonna provide some key principles on how to actually practice this moving forward, especially with staying active and exercise. But before that, we're going to do this. I know you've been sitting for quite some time. I know we just had a break. I'm a big believer in let's, let's stand up. Let's stand up really quick. We're going to actually going to do this lung warm-up and exercise. And on the screen is this called square breathing. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a deep breath in for four seconds, and then we're going to hold our breath for four seconds. And then we're going to exhale out for four seconds. And then we're going to hold, you know, without taking another breath in for four seconds. Okay, so let's try doing that twice. And then we're going to go through some warm-up exercises. Shall we? Join me. Take a deep breath in. Excellent. Hold for four. Now exhale out through your mouth. For... And then hold for four. Let's try it again. Take a deep breath in for four. Hold for four, exhale out for four, and we'll hold for four. Excellent, okay, don't die on me there. But <laughs> that exercise is perfect, right? What we're doing is we're opening up portions of our lungs that weren't open previously by taking deep breaths in. Now, while still standing, let's actually do a warm up. Let's raise our hands up. Let's move, move to the right. Your right, my left, the other way. <laughs> Move our hands. All right, now turn to your neighbor and give him a high 10. And if you got up the other side, another high 10. Excellent. Give yourself a hand. That was fantastic. I think that really plays into the connection, right? Dr. Binus was talking about staying connected. I believe that there is power in us being able to actually touch, being able to actually breathe. Amen. So as we begin, what I actually just started is really starting the key principle before even exercising how important warm-up actually is, right? Warm-up 
allows us to move in a way that we'll be moving with full range of motion. And then it, it helps us to be able to better accommodate as we increase in intensity with our exercises. You want to keep it simple. A warm-up should be simple. And so, for example, if you're going to do squats, you want to squat lighter. If you're going to run, run easier first as a warm-up. If you're going to move, move a little bit easier before going to more aggressive movements. And then the thought is that whatever exercise that you're planning to do, whether that be a brisk walk, a run, it's going to be different for each various different exercises. I, I've met uh, someone here at church and says, I love doing tennis two to three times a day. You can see the warm-up for that is going to be very different from perhaps soccer, from perhaps someone who's actually going to be weightlifting. Because the whole point is that we want to be able to minimize unintended injury before we actually exercise. And many a times we ask, what is the most important exercise? You might ask yourself. And the, really the key is the one that you will enjoy, perform consistently, and use to achieve your goals. For me, running is my exercise, right? I see it that when I run, I'm able to see new things. I'm able to, to be able, well, I mean, time of day and running, and Loma Linda, sometimes it could be dangerous. But, you know, run, run where you're safe. I like the challenge. You want to be consistent, especially with running. And at least for me personally, the goal for running is, is really to, to sweat and also for stress relief. And so for each person, try to be able to identify what is that goal, and it could be very helpful. Of course, timing is very key too, right? And so what is the guidelines for actually uh, for, for exercising? And I know that the slide kind of got a little bit cut off, but... So you will see at the top, for adults ages 18 to 64, at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity activity, such as a brisk walk. And the definition of moderate intensity, I will elaborate on further in, in, my, in, this, in this presentation. The second part of, of really just what we would expect in terms of physical activity is also two days a week of strengthening muscle, and that's resistance. And that's, that is a key component that a lot of us, even myself, tend to actually miss throughout my exercise regimen. You need both. You need to be able to have this aerobic component and also this strengthening component. How about those? I know there are some in, in the crowd here that are, of, uh, that are of age 65 and older. And I don't know why the graphic showed that when you're 65 and older, there's a cane there. But, there's, but I know, I, but there's an additional component. Pastor Doug doesn't walk with a cane, so, you know, that's a testimony. It's not true, right? But it is also 150 minutes a week, moderate activity again, such as brisk walking, two days a week of strengthening muscles, but the third component that's very important for those that are over the age of 65 is this activity to improve balance, such as standing on one foot. How many in the crowd by show of hand know somebody that have actually broken their hip because they didn't have stability, right? It's, it's pretty significant. And we know that mortality actually goes up with, with um, breaking of hips and various different bones. And the rationale is that that's the reason when you get up, you may be a little bit unstable. And so practicing how to be able to strengthen your core and how to keep your balance is very key, especially after the age of 65. So there is a component of being to also understand what is aerobic exercise, right? In the, in the physical activity guidelines, I actually talked about 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity of walking, perhaps, brisk walking. Well, that's an aerobic exercise. That's a cardiovascular exercise. And by definition, the cardiovas cardiovascular exercise is an activity in which, in which the body's large muscles move in a rhythmic manner for a sustained period of time. Such examples are Stairmasters, spinning, I know it says dancing, but folk and cultural dancing, all right, okay. So, and then there's so kickboxing, swimming, and water aerobics. Um, you know, that is the key. And remember, it's 150 minutes per week, and that's what we want to be able to do. This is the cardiovascular, the aerobic exercise. How about strength or resistance training? This is designed to increase the ability to produce muscular force, right? It's, it's muscle, muscle strengthening. That's what we're trying to do. And so strength is defined as the ability to produce force against resistance. Throughout the presentation, you may see or hear me say rep, and it's really just a short form for repetition, right? Which is a single cycle of moving against a force. 
And then a set is multiple repetitions in a row with no breaks. And the goal, remember going back to what the guidelines was actually stating, is we want to be able to perform at least two to three days per week, trying to be able to strengthen all major muscle groups, right? Especially when you're the age of after 65, it's great to be able to strengthen your core and your quads, okay? So these are key things. And earlier, remember how I talked about physical activity? Well, this is what a physical activity is. And many times you'll hear, hear a physician or perhaps you'll hear on some uh, station or even what you're actually watching, it says, you know, increase your physical activity. Well, this is what we mean. Any bodily movement produced by contraction of the muscles that result in a substantial increase in calories required over resting energy expenditure. So basically what we're trying to do is increase your physical activity, meaning movement that burns extra energy. And when we actually have that, this physical activity becomes planned and structured and it's repetitive, it becomes an exercise. And so really what we want everybody to do is, yes, increase your physical activity, but really what we want everybody is to continue to exercise, right? It's a bodily movement done to improve and or maintain, maintain one or more components of physical fitness. It has to be planned physical activity done for a goal. And so it is very key to also think, as I exercise, what is my goal? Am I exercising just to exercise or am I exercising because I want to release my stress? I want to be able to be healthier. Set that goal. You can't score without a goal, right? I'm sure some of you have actually heard that. And what if that goal is to actually lose weight? Well, this is great. I'd love to be able to share with you what Def Dr. Kevin Cordona is, Division Head of Endocrinology at Loma Linda Stating, at least to treat obesity. Three tips to, to treat obesity. Weight loss of as little as 5% of body weight may result in health benefits, even though it may not give the desired cosmetic effect. Okay? Just 5%. All obesity treatments should be based on sustainable lifestyle modification, which includes caloric reduction and increased physical activity. You're hearing that again, right? Even in ideal circumstances, lifestyle modification usually achieves weight loss about 5 to 7%. So what we're seeing is that just even little small movements can have profound effects, and that what we actually need is caloric reduction in addition to actually increase physical activity. And so the increase in physical activity, if we could actually just increase our physical activity or even just exercise, right, by 10%, by reducing inactivity, increasing our activity, we'll be able to actually decrease about half a million deaths per year. And I know the chart is small, but it shows that inactivity is really a big key component to a lot of various different problems that we're actually facing, even mental issues. This is a recent uh, publication by JAMA Internal Medicine in 2022. And it showed that if every US adult increased physical activity by 10 minutes a day, we could actually prevent 100,000 deaths. You know, approximately 6.9% of annual deaths could be averted and the greater benefits were associated with larger increases in physical activity. This similar benefit, and this is the key, I love this part, were observed for men, women, Mexican-Americans, non-Hispanic, black Americans, and non-Hispanic white Americans. This is, this is something that we, I think, all can do, and this is something I feel that I can continue to also try to improve on too. Now for some I know in the crowd, you may ask, but if I exercise, is it safe for me to exercise? And, and I think that there are some discussions that, that need to be had with your primary care physician or your healthcare professional. But for the most part, the risk is low and is outweighed by the benefits, right? The dangers of physical inactivity far outweigh the risk of exercise in most people. Each additional hour of TV watch per day, <laughs> the risk of mortality increases by 11%. Most recently, when I was looking online at Statistica, the good news is that in 2022, U.S. adults spend an average of about three hours per day of watching TV. Three hours. In 2022, in 2020, I'm sorry, during COVID, it was up to as high as three and a half hours per day due to the pandemic. So while the numbers continue to, at least we say, go down, it is important, right? Nonetheless, 
that if we can continue to minimize, even just watching TV, we could decrease the risk of dying. Additionally, there's, a, there's safety in cardiovascular exercise, right? How about if I'm exercising, I may have a bad heart. Without heart disease, one in 400,000 to 800, 400 to 800,000 hours of exercise will you actually have potentially that risk of a cardiac event. If you have a known heart disease, one in 62,000 hours of exercise, you potentially have, a, you could have a cardiac event. It is very, very slim. You know, earlier today, I think we had Dr. Schaffenberg, I believe, class of 48, right, 99 years old, came up to stage, and that was amazing. I want to share with you a story of Dr. Harvey Elder, class of 57, right, 90 years old, a retired physician at Loma Linda, who has been so instrumental and key in our spiritual care and continues to be a mentor to so many. But on January 9th, while he was walking at Drayson Center on the treadmill, he had a massive cardiac event. In fact, his heart stopped for five minutes. They were doing CPR continuously for five minutes. By God's grace, he was out of the hospital in two days. He was saved, and, and he will tell you, the biggest, aside from the chest pain that he had, the most memorable thing that he said that was so profound to him was that, he had a fourth-year medical student pray for him. All right, amen. Isn't that great? The mission is still strong, but the key and the point also is that Dr. Harvey Elder continued to exercise, and he told me, I'm going to go back and exercise some more. So I think there is, there is a testimony in that, that cardio events could can happen, but I think it's very important that we continue to live a, a healthy lifestyle so we can actually more readily survive something like that. What are three tips from the head of cardiology, Dr. Anthony Hilliard at Loma Linda has to say? Slash added sugar. According to a more recent also publication in JAMA, researchers reported that people who, who at the, had the most sugar had a higher risk of death from heart disease, even if they weren't overweight. All right, he says, tame your stress. Dr. Dr. Hilliard says, tame your stress. Stress can increase your risk of heart disease by two and a half fold, similar to smoking and diabetes. The thought is that chronic stress puts the body in a constant fight or flight mode, triggering inflammation, high blood pressure, and other unhealthy changes. And nurture close relationship. And I think Dr. Bynes has touched on this, right? One study found that people who were socially isolated and lonely were more likely to have heart attack or stroke than people with strong networks. Now, I'm going to tell you at this point, I, I promised my children I'd do this, and so I thought it'd be great, and, and just start with this. Why did the grape go out with the raisin? Anybody? Because it couldn't find a date. I've got 30 more minutes on stage. I, I promise you that's my last joke. So moving onward, the safety of exercise again, right? Just to be able to provide more data on this. Resistance training, increased risk of acute musculoskeletal injury or exacerbation of chronic pain. What is the incidence of something like this? If you were doing bodybuilding, you had a chance of 0.12 to 0.7 injuries per lifter year or 0.2 to 1 injury per 1,000 participation hours. How about walking? You're at risk of 0.19 injury per 1,000 participation hours. And if you're gardening, it was one injury per 1,000 participation hours. The whole point is that gardening is dangerous and you should not be doing gardening. What you should be doing is bodybuilding and walking. If not, if anything, maybe bodybuilding and walking while gardening, okay? Like, so just consider something like that. But I think it's just to highlight that really when done properly, right, we want to be able to make sure posture is correct, make sure that you're, you're not doing things harmfully, that it's relatively safe. Exercising is extremely safe. How about joint health? Dr. Christina Downey, our division head of rheumatology, running and other physical activity isn't bad for your knees. Many times we hear this, and I think that there is some validity to that, depending upon the stress, the impact, also perhaps the shoes that you're actually wearing. It helps keep the muscles and tendons which support your joints strong and healthy. 
Exercising prevents pain from muscle imbalances and keeps you active longer. And interestingly enough, I didn't show Dr. Downey about the guidelines and recommendations, but she too already states, in addition to the 150 minutes of weekly aerobic exercise, include two days of strength training and finish every workout with flexibility and mobility exercises. I think she highlights a great point, and that is the stretching component. Because many times, I don't know if you're you know, much like me, I'm, I'm pretty stiff, especially when I wake up in the morning. I can't catch my kids. This is a great pyramid in terms of how much exercise. At the very top, the least amount of things that you should be doing is watching TV, right? As we slowly start to come down, you can see that we start to increase the various different activities, whether that be aerobic exercise, um, perhaps recreational activities, cardiac activities, but really everyday activities such as walking and staying active or perhaps even walking your dogs, you want to keep these things and keep building up, right? But minimize, of course, on things like watching TV. All of these things have profound effects, again, and systemically, it's very important because even exercise affects the liver and also the gut. This is what Dr. Michael Volk, division head of gastroenterology and hepatology is state. Three tips to maintain gastrointestinal and liver wellness. Exercise of what we've been staying. And early on, I've told you with the amount of blood flow going through as the liver is one of the major organs that actually filters a lot of harmful things in our body. Eat a healthy diet. And then be careful about what else you put in your body. Most specifically, especially alcohol and how it can affect the liver, right? And cause liver cirrhosis or liver failure. So going back to exercise and just recapping, you know, we've gone through this. We've, we've already talked about the various different definitions between strength, a rep, and what a set and a goal actually is. And so I want to be able to highlight more on all muscle groups and the different type of movements that we can actually do. This is just some, right? A vertical push-up. You've got horizontal push-ups, hip hinges, vertical pull, horizontal pull, a squat. These are all things, and I think I'm going to call Dr. I'm going to actually call Pastor Doug to come on out to actually do these, but I, I don't think he's ready quite yet to do that. But the main point is to make sure that we're actually trying to hit the muscle groups such as our chest, our shoulders, our back, triceps, biceps, abs, thighs, hamstrings, and calves. And what does that actually look like? These are some examples. It's not all the examples, but these are some examples of how you can actually do this at home. I was intentional in just showing what we could do without weights, things that you could actually do just at home. I was debating whether or not we should do this earlier during our warm-up, but I was afraid we would hit somebody in unintentionally or intentionally um, and get hurt. But you can see top left what a vertical push could actually look like, right? In the middle, top middle top would be horizontal push and how you can push against the wall and slowly walk your way down to strengthen your chest, your arms. The hip hinge, which is very important. Remember earlier we talked about guidelines and trying of those over the age of 65 to be able to strengthen the core and balance. A hip hinge would be a great exercise to be able to do. Vertical pull with a band. Um, a lot of times vertical pull, we think about our pull-ups, right? The horizontal pull is another way if we're not able to do a vertical pull, okay? And then, of course, squats. And it's great to be able to see that you can actually do squats with a chair, right? There's no need to do it against the wall. Um, there are a lot of great chair exercises uh, for those that are elderly, and, and they've got great videos, great tips, especially online, and I highly encourage people to do that. So as we move forward in the next, actually, half of my presentation, I'm going to be talking a lot about, really, uh, the key components on how we can actually apply, not just me telling you, just exercise. These are the way to exercise. I want you to be able to actually think this through and really come up and formulate a plan to be able to better exercise. And so frequency, right? How often are you active? Intensity, how hard are you going to be working out? Time, how long are you active? The type, what are you actually doing? Volume, the total amount of work, and then progression. So this FIT-VP is what I'm going to be going through in the next couple of minutes. And so let's see. Let's start off with frequency. 
So a lot of times, especially in it's broken down between aerobic, and we'll, you'll see also those with resistance training, but with aerobic, you wanna have one to seven sessions per week, right, to be able to continue to stay active. And we'll talk a little bit more on the intensity and the time, because it could vary for each one of us. But it's interesting that even if we're not able to do this every single day throughout the week, there's been publications and papers that have talked about weekend warriors, where within weekend warriors, one to two sessions per week may be sufficient to reduce all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and cancer mortality. So if you're not able to hit it throughout the week, try your best to maybe even just hit it during the weekend, right? Two to three full-body sessions per week is definitely helpful. Multiple muscle group sessions per week is always encouraged, right? Because you want to hit all the muscles within your body, not, let's say, just working out your arms or your legs. And always give time for rest, right? Approximately 48 hours of rest between muscle group sessions. And, uh, next slide here. And next is also intensity, right? External intensity is what can be measured. Many times external in intensity you can think about is the weight on the bar, the weight on your barbell. But really what's even more important, and I'll show you later on, is your internal intensity. How hard does it feel? And that is your rate of perceived exertion. The goal, again, is to have it to be at moderate or greater, uh, or, or moderate or greater to get benefits. And that the benefit part is actually a big part, and I'm gonna show you exactly on a little chart on how we can actually gauge between moderate and we could say severe intensity. Let me see here. These are three tips to actually keep yourself out of the hospital by Dr. Mike Matus, division head for the hospitalist group. Much of the preventable diseases seen in the hospital today is directly due to poor diet, zero exercise, and excessive processed foods. Isn't it interesting how it's repeating again, right? It's almost a rec recurring theme, at least what all the physicians are saying. Do not underestimate the value of community, right? Think about that. I think that's, again, back to relationships. And do not ignore the nagging aspect of your health that has changed. And I think that's a great point because many times we have this self-perception that everything is okay. Um, I'm doing fine. I'm, I'm doing all right. It's okay. I'll take care of this later. And lo and behold, we're actually putting off something that could actually be brewing within. And so always encourage that if there's something that just doesn't seem right, it's time to get a good checkup, right, with your physician. And always having that gauge. So going back to moderate to intense activity, the rate of perceived exertion, if you can see on this chart, is really tends to be in the blue. Okay, and it's okay if, if you're not getting all of this. What I will say is that I'm gonna have a couple of slides towards the end where I would say these are the key slides that you wanna do and this is how you wanna move forward, okay? But just bear with me. So this way, there's a structured way to what I'm trying to present to you. So within moderate, right, intensity, you can see that talk or sing, it doesn't allow you, you just, you're not able to actually sing in moderate or even vigorous activity, right? So if you're walking and you're not able to sing during that time, your, your, your rate of perceived exertion is a six to eight. That's moderate. If you're not able to talk when you're actually walking, that's vigorous. Similarly, you can think about how many more reps could I've actually done if you're doing strengthening? Because remember, we want to do the aerobic and we also want to do the resistance. And if you feel that, oh, I could have done maybe two more reps, then that would put you in the moderate category. But if you could actually do more, then it's less. So these are two various different aspects. That is important. I think that could actually be helpful. But again, I'm going to give you a little bit more ideas on how to better apply this later on. Right. So how hard, right? We talk about intensity. So for aerobic, the goal, again, is 150 minutes, OK? Talk and sing, you're not able to act. If you cannot sing, that's six to eight, that's a moderate. If you cannot talk, that's vigorous. And I know there's a lot of people who want to keep talking, and that may be the best time is to exercise so they're not talking as much. <laughs> Resistance training, right? Uh, we want rate of perceived exertion, six to eight for each set. The reps in reserve, four to two. But as fitness improves, the external ex intensity will need to change to keep internal intensity at the appropriate level. Basically, as we continue to gain more strength, we will start to notice that we'll need to add on more external intensity. Similarly, you starting off, let's say, a five pound weight, we know that as time progresses, you're gonna start to increase more to six, to seven, to eight, to nine. And that's really the goal. 
And in terms of timing, let's see here, in terms of timing, working hard or exceeding again, we want to be able to at least look down at the example, walk 30 minutes on five days, or perhaps do intervals. And these are the various different combinations that you could actually do. The timing and weekly goal can actually be broken up, so it doesn't need to be 150 minutes straight, right? And on there, I talk about Tabitha intervals. And Tabitha is a style of high-intensity um, interval training. It involves 20 seconds of maximum effort followed by 10 seconds of rest. So it's just interval training. You may have heard that before. And especially, if, well, as we talk about for resistance training, there's no set duration, right? The key component of this is that you always want to have 48 hours of rest in between. And there are various different types of exercises. Now, let me see. My clicker is... I think I may be out of battery here, but a uh, picture didn't show. But for aerobic exercise, you can really do whatever you want. It's blank there because either that be a brisk walk, speed walking, running, going upstairs. All these various different things are all great. And with resistance training, body weight, bands, machines, free weights. But the key component in this is compound exercises. Because compound exercises work multiple muscle groups at the same time. So an example of compound exercise is like squats, right? When you do a squat, you're exercising your quads, your glutes, and your calves. Now, there's my... <laughs> On volume, frequency, and time, right? You want to be able to have, again, a minimum of 150 minutes of moderate exercise. And you can actually do up to 75 minutes of vigorous exercise, or you can combine the two. And really what we're trying to do is combine in the resistance side reps and sets, right? And the amount of exercises. The goal is to continue to be able to keep going up more and more and more. And you won't know how to go up until you actually measure it. And so volume and knowing how many reps and sets are very key too, especially for resistance training. Ultimately, what we're heading for is progression, right? The ability to increase over time. And everything that I've been talking about and trying to be able to establish is for us to be able to safely go up. We induce a stress. We induce a point for our body to be able to get better and stronger, give it a moment of recovery, and then hit at it again. Time and time again. Because remember, the goal in this is a lifestyle change, right? We don't want to only do this just momentarily or just once. The rule of thumb is that you want to have less than 10% increase work per volume. I know that for myself, I like to just hit it hard, and sometimes when I hit it way too hard, that's when I actually get hurt. So little small movements is really, little small increments is really what we're trying to hit, whether that be for cardiovascular training or even for resistance training, right? An example for cardiovascular training is just adding one additional minute to each 10-minute exercise session that you're having. Similarly, in terms of distance, right, one-tenth of a mile. For resistance, adding another rep or another set, adding a, little, adding a little bit more on the weights. But you want to be slow. Don't hit it too hard, right? Because, again, remember, progression is something that is in the long run of things, right? It's not short. We want to be able to make sure that we're safe and we can keep continuing to keep doing it. So external intensity, I'm going to go straight to the second bullet point. And external intensity will change automatically over time if maintaining a constant internal intensity, meaning becoming, it, things start to become easier when we swim, bike, run at the same speed with time. You will start to feel that, man, I can go further. I can go faster. And then you start to increase a little bit more in terms of your internal intensity. And as just by default, your external intensity will also go up too. How do we actually apply this in terms of, let's say, a prescription for exercise, right? This is one of those slides that if, that I wanted, if you take home, this would be one of them, and I got another one a little bit later. And really, for aerobic exercise, what you want to do is start with something enjoyable, right? Something that you can easily accomplish, whether that be walking down the street, walking around the block, start off with that first. And then slowly start to add increments, right? Maybe the next thing would be walking down to the end of, of I don't know, the corner or to church. Just something like that. But you want to keep a goal in mind, right? So, and I think to the right of that, you can see the various different examples. Walking five minutes every day and add one minute each week. Four months, walking 24 minutes a day. And of course, when it comes to folk dancing or cultural dancing, you could add different various different songs. 
But linear progression, the key for this is that as we progress, sooner or later we will plateau, okay? And that is when we'll need to add on various different exercises to achieve the next level. Like a lot of things in life, expect a setback, all right? There could be setbacks from injuries. And the goal is not to worsen the symptoms if you do, ex you have an injury, right? We want to be able to take some time, take some time to rest, 24 to 48 hours to after your exercise. Don't panic, right? They say motion is lotion, and that actually applies to really stretching. I mean, right now I got a kink in my neck because I don't think I actually stretched out very well, but it's a prime example, right? That stretching is so key. And then of course, modify. Right? If you were lifting too hard and you perhaps are sore, well then maybe you shouldn't hit it so hard. And you can just modify your range of motion, your intensity, the volume, type of exercise, and obviously if it just continues to happen, seek medical advice. But the key is, this is what I think, what I want to be able to show everybody. This is actually Karen and Pastor Doug that I took a picture of when they were at the gym. Okay, so maybe not, but it's not too late. It's never too late for us to be able to exercise, whether that be aerobic or strengthening, but the key is that we also, we just need both, right? It's not just one. I also wanted to add on, these are three tips to keep healthy and prevent infections. Infections is key, especially to Dr. Veltman, their division head for infectious diseases. Keep up to date on immunizations, control your sugars, and this is a component that I think not a lot of us actually are aware of, that sexually transmitted diseases are on the rise. And we're encouraging everybody to talk to your physicians or reduce that risk. And why is that? Because after COVID-19, we've seen STDs starting to increase. And there may be some that are actually watching, and this actually could be applicable. So in addition to exercise, this is that other slide that I would take a picture of, because this actually gives actually a very... I would say, very pragmatic way to be able to apply what I've actually been talking about. For aerobic exercises, I will walk for 10 minutes at a pace where I can talk, but not sing on five days of the week. I will add one minute to each day every week until I'm doing at least 150 minutes per week. And that gives you everything right there, your frequency, your intensity, time, the type, volume, and progression. This is a smart way to be able to set a goal, right? And this is just an example. With goals, to be smart should be specific. It should be measurable. It should be attainable, relevant, and timely. So what is your goal? Consider when you're actually starting to exercise, right? What is your goal? What went well after you started to exercise? What are the barriers um, that, you're, that is helping, that's holding you back from meeting or exceeding your goal? The strategies to be able to overcome these barriers. And additionally, do you want to continue? What would you change? What would you add? And how will you know if you're successful, right? And ultimately, what will be the game changer? I know that there's a lot of various different things that I've talked about. And this is one of the last things I'm going to actually end on. Um, and this is last three tips from Dr. Mark Reeves, our division head for hematology and oncology. And it's three tips to lower your risk of cancer. Exercise more, imagine that. Don't start smoking, smoke fewer, quit smoking, right? This whole gamut of just, just getting smoke out of the way and eat less red meat, right? It's interesting that there was another study that was published in 2022 and they discovered that overall cancer risk was 2% lower among people who ate meat five times or less per week compared with those who consume more. The risk was 10% lower among those who only ate fish and 14% lower among vegetarians and vegans. You can see that just by continuous lowering of eating less red meat will put you away from seeing Dr. Mark Reeves, which is a good thing. Again, I think, I think my clicker might have actually ran out of battery here. Well, I... I, I guess so. I mean, it's like, I, I don't know if, if anybody can help me out with that, but I will end with this. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20. For ye are brought, bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Amen? And with that, I think I can just end with prayer, or let's bow our heads, shall we? 
Father God, I thank you for this time. Thank you that together as a church, we can continue to worship you. And I just pray that you will continue to move in everyone's lives here, that you will touch our hearts, touch our hearts so that we can make better changes, better thoughts, better choices. We love you and we thank you, dear Lord. Everything we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for your time and your attention. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Laren. Just so you know, we didn't, we didn't block his slides here because he's running out of time. There was a computer glitch, so they're working on that. Well, we've made it to our final presentation today, and we've kept the best to last. We've got a number of questions that have come in, both from those who are here and also those who are watching online. So we're going to take a five-minute break, and then we've got our final panel discussion. And if you haven't posted a question yet, you are free to do that. There's a little QR code that you'll see on the bottom of the, uh, the card that you received. And uh, we'll be back in about five minutes for our final presentation. Mm -hmm.